Thank you, Nick. For a second there, I thought you were about to preempt all, all of my speech. And, uh, well, and, and thanks to the CPS for hosting uh, this evening. I'd like to do three things in this speech, which I'll warn you is a little bit long. The first is talk about where Labour is. Then the second thing I'll do is talk about what the current uh, response on the centre-right is. And then thirdly, map out a way forward. Ten years ago, Lehman Brothers went bust. It wasn't quite the beginning of the global financial crisis, but it signalled that it really was a crisis. A decade later, many people in Britain and elsewhere are still trying to make sense of it. And one popular story is that the crisis was a reckoning, a judgment on a failed system. The near collapse of the Western banking system and the long recession that followed are taken by some to be a sign that liberal capitalism and free markets were fatally flawed. That the long period of steady growth since the 1980s, in what then Bernanke called the Great Moderation, was really a grand illusion. That capitalism has been a mistake all along. And this has been a filled day for the far left around the world. From Syriza in Greece to Bernie Sanders in the US. And it played a major role in the takeover of the UK Labour Party by its hard left. Almost exactly seven years after Lehman failed. And this week we've seen Jeremy Corbyn and John McDonnell setting out their plans to dismantle the free markets should they take power. Reintroducing mandatory sectoral wage bargaining and Benite schemes for worker control. That the IPPR, once the Blairite think tank par excellence, released a report on the economy this week that was warmly welcomed by John McDonnell is a sign of how total Corbyn's victory has been on the left. The left thinks capitalism's goose is cooked and they can't wait to carve up the carcass. But it's not just labor. One of the things I've been doing as university's and science minister is going around the country talking and listening to students and young people. In most of these meetings, I've asked what we could do to raise prosperity for the next generation. And you know what? I have never got an answer that was not about raising taxes and spending more. <laughs> the idea of growing the national cake or moving up the economic league table so there will be more to share never ever comes up. So why am I here? I figured that the far left have got their ambassadors. In fact, they're rock stars. From Stormzy, Yanis Varoufakis, in now, it seems, to the Archbishop of Canterbury. <laughs> and a grassroots operation momentum to spread their ideas far and wide. I think we need a similar renaissance on the right, with our own thinkers, our own musicians, our own artists, our own evangelists, and our politicians, all making the case for open markets. And I believe the CPS can help lead the way in this endeavour. There is a long chart sheet against capitalism, and some of it is justified. When some big businesses can pro have privatised profits and socialised losses, as the big banks did in the financial crisis, you can understand the thirst for revenge among the populace. It's also true on a day-to-day -day basis. The email I got today from a constituent complaining that a utility company had hiked its bills by 20% for no reason is depressingly typical. We've got to be honest. Capitalism is not perfect, but it is the best system we've got. To those who say that true socialism could work, but hasn't been tried, I say I do not want my children to be guinea pigs for a Marxist experiment. And this is precisely what it would be. 
Let's not forget that some of the plans and policies that Corbyn's Labour most admire are those that were too crazy for the 1970s. But Michael Foote would probably reject some of the policies that are being pursued today. So it is not that they are going back to the 1970s, they are going back to the policies that were rejected in the 1970s of being too left-wing. So this brings me to the main thrust of my talk today. What the right in the UK should make of all of this. The fortunes of the British right in the last century have been shaped in no small part by our relationship with business and with capitalism. The Conservative Party's remarkable electoral success in the last hundred years has relied on it. Not just because we have had, for most of that period, a reputation as the party of business and the party of sound economic management, but also because we offered a vision of how capitalism benefited citizens. Our electoral success was based on our ability to reinvigorate capitalism, not fix it, in order to match the challenge of the time. And between the wars, Noel Skelton's property-owning democracy, as Britain was rebuilding itself after the Second World War, <coughs> we were comfortable with consumerism and the birth of an affluent society. And as the 70s rolled into the 80s, Margaret Thatcher grasped faster than anyone the dynamics of the entrepreneurial post-industrial society that Britain was becoming. The genius of her government was in her diagnosis of what the world of the 1980s was about, as in her policy prescriptions. So I believe we are at our best when we are pro-enterprise and pro-endeavour. And when we do this in a way that is clear that our motive is to make the world a better place and improve a lot of ordinary citizens. But if all voters hear from us is an echo of the left's concerns and singing from Labour's hymn sheet without an enthusiastic and full-throated endorsement of open markets, we will only have ourselves to blame when they turn away from capitalism. We know that we are the party of sound economic management, but we also need to offer an optimistic vision of the prosperous country we want to create. So how are we measuring up? Well, firstly, let me share with you a story about a fascinating piece of research which epitomises the current relationship between parts of the right and business. The research was carried out a decade ago, coincidentally, about the time that Northern Rock and Lehman Brothers were going under. A team of psychologists from Germany's Max, Max Planck Institute for Biological Cybernetics asked a question. What happens to people who find themselves in the wilderness without a map? They recruited volunteers and sent them to remote places. A thick forest, open fields, the Tunisian desert, and recorded where they ended up. Without a map, unsurprisingly, they all got lost. <laughs> but interestingly, they all got lost in the same way. Very quickly, all the volunteers ended up walking in circles and quite small ones, endlessly retracing the same steps. Sometimes they turn to the left, sometimes to the right, but all going nowhere. When I look at how we on the right have reacted to the perceived failings of capitalism, I can't, think of, I can't help thinking of those volunteers as a salutary warning. Disconcerted by what seems like a change in attitudes to business, and by the cumulative surprises of the financial crisis and the EU referendum, there's a risk that we find ourselves going round and round in unproductive circles. And like the hapless volunteers in the experiment, the circles can begin by turning left or turning right. Sometimes we appear to accept criticisms of capitalism at face value and try to out Corbyn Corbyn, a futile task. At other times, we seem to want to take on the mantle of Trumpian economic nationalism and protectionism. And sometimes we just reach for the old playbook, 
implying that if we're simply deregulating cap taxes, all will be fine. The end result is we can look confused and directionless by the hikers in the experiment. We simultaneously risk conceding the arguments of the populist extremes of both the left and right, while also seeming complacent about people's <coughs> concerns. So when conservatives veer between talking business down, ignoring voters' concerns, and telling business to shut up, or worse, it is a clear sign we have lost our way. When it comes to our relationship with business, we must unscramble our compass if we are to stand any chance of defeating the hard left, and we need to find our way, and quickly. If you are lost in an unfamiliar place, like the volunteers in the study I talked about earlier, there are three things you need to do. You need to get some sense of where you are. You need a reference point, some fixed objective to guide you, and only then can you make a plan to get yourself to where you want to be. The same is true in politics, more or less. First, we need to take stock of the current economic position we find ourselves in and the challenges we face. Then we need to find out and remind ourselves which way is north. In other words, the principles and values that we would adhere to, and based on that, we develop the plan of action. So how do we win this fight? I believe that we must start by defending our record on the economy. And here are some points you would hear at a momentum rally. Employment is at a record high and unemployment at record low. This did not happen by accident. So when Labour say they want to raise corporation tax, we should ask them, what price do you want to pay? How many jobs are you willing to destroy? Let's celebrate and let's salute those who take risks, build businesses and create jobs. The deficit continues to fall, thanks to the policies of the coalition and of the present government. But for many young people I speak to, austerity is seen as a central tenet of conservative faith. We should always be clear, austerity was not a matter of religion, but a matter of necessity. And without it, we would all be worse off. There is good news too when it comes to inequality. For all the talk of rising inequality around the world, inequality in the UK has fallen to its lowest level in 30 years. And this is not according to Conservative Central Office, this is according to the Office for National Statistics and the Independent Institute for Physical, Physical Studies. And it was a Conservative government that delivered the living wage and our flexible labour market which cushioned people in their jobs during the Great Recession. We also need to recognise what our record and success rests on, our can-do optimism as a country. And nowhere is this more obvious than in the area of technology and the industries of the future. The UK is undoubtedly, the UK is undoubtedly Europe's tech hub. We play host to 13 of Europe's 34 tech unicorns. That's companies that are valued at more than a billion pounds. More venture capital is invested here than in Germany, France and Sweden combined. In 2017, our tech sector grew 2.6 times faster than the economy as a whole and increased by 4.5%. This is a far cry from the picture that John McDonnell is painting of our country. And why are we so successful? Our strong and agile institutions have a role to play, our capital markets, our widely admired legal system, our world-class universities, and others that sometimes get less recognition, like our intellectual property regime. Britain is a beacon of global excellence. Our enduring strength is our openness and our tradition of entrepreneurship. So as we look to the future, we need to double down on these strengths. 
So we are doing well and have the right foundations for a bigger, brighter, bolder future. But if we are to fend off McDonald and its momentum hordes, we must also be clear and confident in defence of the values that underpin capitalism and open markets. We should not be cowed in defence of timeless and proven values. There is a moral case for free markets that is even more important than the material one. As the American writer Conor Friedersdorf put it, nothing better protects minorities than a system where they can pursue their needs and wants outside the realm of popular control. Free markets are inherently liberal and they give people more choice than a system where the government even a democratic one, decides who gets what. Some of my colleagues have said that the Archbishop of Canterbury was wrong to hold forth on his views about capitalism this week. They said politics and morality don't mix. I say the opposite. Economic growth is a moral issue. And I think we can defend capitalism and I'm convinced that it is the best way of delivering. So I would extend the hand of friendship to the Archbishop, and I'll be more than happy to debate this with him. Perhaps over a delivery of pizza, with an Uber <laughs> dropping us at home and afterwards. As Conservatives, we believe that individuals are better interpreters of their own destiny than bureaucracies or impersonal forces. Institutions or rules cannot solve all of our problems, and they tend to have a tendency to grow. We must assiduously create space for individuals to thrive and resist state through the stretch. And this means that we should put a lot of store on enterprise and initiative, a society that empowers individuals and businesses to innovate. And finally, on our values, I believe that optimism is key. I'm optimistic for Britain's future. I'm also an optimist about technology, science, and the future. Every technology of the past, from the computer to the aeroplane to the power loom, and it had its detractors, worried that it would upend society and change things for the worse. These worried have not, those worried have not always had been baseless, but the benefits of innovation have massively exceeded the downside. Instead, technology has made the modern world more prosperous than any society in history. There's a pragmatic reason for my optimism <clears throat> too. If conservatives treat the modern world with scorn and scepticism, the modern world will return the favour. Optimism is intellectually justified, but it's also good politics. But as we survey the world of technology and the less reaction to it, the left here are actually the forces of conservatism, who when they see every technolog technological change and every potential for improvement, think about how they can use the system of the past to try to shackle its development. But we need a plan. Our plan for the future has to have enterprise and innovation at its heart. If we want Britain to prosper, we need to commit to being a place where entrepreneurs and business can thrive and take on the world. What this means is we need a new model economy. It must be based on entrepreneurship, innovation, and a new approach to regulation that allows them to flourish. Too often, society only recognises entrepreneurs when they've made it, and then often take that success for granted. But for most of them, it is tough and often lonely process where you try, try and try again, sometimes failing before you eventually succeed. We should make it easier for entrepreneurs in this country and we should also, make, we should also celebrate their success. How do we do this? A good place to start is by talking the talk. We on the right must take unequivocally that we believe in entrepreneurs and risk takers and businesses matter to us. 
Many of us in this room probably take it for granted. But in the face of the onslaught from the left, you've got to shout even louder. There are also times in politics when talk is cheap. But given the mixed messages about business from across the political spectrum, now isn't one of them. Stating our beliefs is an important place to begin. The next thing we need to do is to recognise that enterprise is an international undertaking. When you look at countries that have become prosperous through innovation, Israel, Ireland, Singapore, you will see that they share a profoundly international outlook. As the computer pioneer Bill Joy said, no matter how good you are, the best people work for someone else. <laughs> and what is true for tech companies is true for countries too. This is certainly true if we look at our most dynamic startups. A majority of the UK's tech unicorns were founded by people from overseas. We need to make sure that the UK is open to trade, that we provide a welcome to the brightest and the best, the talented and the entrepreneurial. Whether they are students, researchers, businesses, business people or company founders, these people, like our own brightest and best, have a choice about where they live and work. We must give them a reason to be here. We also need to think seriously about how these businesses are regulated, especially when technology is changing industries fast. But this isn't because, as some have suggested, governments in the UK or elsewhere have somehow taken our foot off the pedal when it comes to regulation. Nor is it simply a question of cutting regulation. The old one-in, two-out model it's because the, ch the challenges are changing as we see more information-rich businesses with novel business models. We need new tech-savvy rules and processes to deal with the challenges of a new economy and enable the businesses of the future to thrive. Take one example my department, that my department has recently worked on. When people use search engines like Google to search for films or songs, rights holders discovered they were often pointed to pirated content. This is bad for artists and discourages the next generation of creators. But it's hard to deal with, but this is a problem that is hard to deal with under existing rules. It required careful government broker discussions between search engines and rights holders to reach a fair deal. As technology changes, business models change. So what we need is the sort of nimble regulation we'll need to see more of. And nimble regulation doesn't just help stop market abuses, it also benefits consumers. Governments need to understand what rules need to change to allow new business models, from Uber and electronic scooters to challenger banks and fintech. When I was a backbench MP, I wrote a report proposing that uh, quantitative easing should be channeled through alternative lenders and there shouldn't be a bias to established incumbents. I wrote a report on this, which George Osborne then adopted. And this helped companies like Funding Circle, as well as the big banks. And in a small way, this has helped the UK's alternative finance sector grow into the global force it is today. And I was delighted to read in the Financial Times the other day that Funding Circle is now seeking a stock market flotation. So now with the same end in mind, we are setting the Regulators Pioneer Programme, to get more regulators thinking about innovation regulation, but also innovative regulation that can protect consumers without stymieing honest entrepreneurs. <coughs> but when we look at this new world, we face challenges from, robot, from robots, from AI and automation, which will change the way we live and work, and lead to different ways of working. If you are John McDonnell, this is an excuse and a reason to sow fear into the hearts of workers. But if we react to those challenges with attitudes built for the old labour-intensive economy, we will lag behind the rest of the world. If you take many people in the sandwich generation, who have to balance looking after older parents with looking after their children, for many of them, the gig economy and the opportunities it affords are a godsend. So just attacking the gig economy is a cheap shot. 
Instead, we should champion the job opportunities and the flexibility allows, rather than trying to regulate it out of existence. We should also accept that for many people, the opportunities that the gig economy provides are actually empowering. Of course, taking on permanent employees while paying them too little and pretending they're casual staff should not be acceptable. But for those that want flexibility, for those who flexibility makes a difference, we should be dealing with regulation in a way that makes it happen. And this needs to also, in regulation, we need to start from an understanding that new technologies have the potential to improve things for consumers and for workers, and that they need tech savvy regulation which will take careful thought, which is what the review of modern employment practices, led by Matthew Taylor, for the government has been all about. Another challenge is getting the tax policy right for the new economy. We've lowered tax rates for businesses, and it's right that we should be aiming to have one of the most competitive business tax regimes in the world. But I believe that whichever company you are, the quid pro quo of having the lowest tax regime in the world is that you pay your taxes. So clamping down on corporate tax avoidance should be a conservative crusade. And that is why I'm proud that it was a conservative government that put tax and avoidance on the G7 agenda. And we should continue to be on the, on the front foot when it comes to making sure our tax system is fit for the modern, intangible, intensive economy. So when Labour talk about Amazon, we should remind them that it's a conservative government that has, made, that has been working to make sure that companies pay their fair share. And the Labour government in 30 years never did that. The new economy will also require new approaches to finance. Entrepreneurship cannot flourish if businesses cannot raise the finance they need to grow. Increasingly, the most promising businesses have few tangible assets that banks are willing to lend against. And getting bank finance for early stage businesses was never easy to begin with. A small minority of businesses solve this problem through venture capital. But we should be helping more businesses access equity finance, ensuring institutions like the London Stock Exchange with this ambitious program for high growth companies work. Government has a role too. And this is particularly true when it comes to R&D. If you want to make the most of the coming technological opportunities, we will need as a country to invest in R&D and innovation. Most of this investment needs to come from business, but economists have long recognised the uncertainties of R&D mean that government needs to co-invest alongside business, either through tax credits or through public research. As technology becomes more important, the role, our role will grow which is why I'm pleased that the government has committed to the biggest ever increase in public R&D funding in our country's history, and why we have, been, we have even more ambitious goals for the future. We already reap the benefits. One example I'll point to is the success of Genomics England, the organization set up with the support of the coalition government to sequence 10,000 human genomes. Many thought it would never work, but through a bold entrepreneurial approach, is that it has established itself as a world leader in genome sequencing and has positioned the UK for success in this important field. I see the same in other fields. The UK's dynamic entrepreneurial space sector, our world leading nuclear fusion researchers, our deep expertise of artificial intelligence, they all rest in a combination of entrepreneurship and public investment. We need to think big and we need to back the kind of moonshot projects that will help us prosper as a nation. But I also believe that in backing the new technologies of the future, and backing entrepreneurship and innovation, is how we will spread prosperity from, from Battersea to Doncaster. Because often when you talk about these new, these new economic models, the assumption is that somehow some parts of the country will be left behind. 
But one of the successes we have as a country are world-class universities across the country. In every city of this country, there is a university. And as our universities become better at research, as government funding and public research and development goes through our universities, there is a huge opportunity to use our universities as hubs to spread growth regionally across the country. Skills are obviously important. The OECD this week pointed out that employers' demand for graduates shows no signs of slowing. It shows it's all the more important to make sure our universities are providing high quality teaching. But it's also why I'm being tenacious in pushing them to deliver value for money, in cracking down on grade inflation, essay mills, and bounce on seats courses, and in publishing data to help applicants understand the return from the degree that they apply for. One thing that leavers and remainers agree on is that leaving the EU will be anything but business as usual. But I believe that it offers us a once in a generation chance to ask ourselves what sort of economy we want to be. And if we are going to make a success of it, we need to seize this chance, seize the future and invest in it. We need to do so in a spirit of optimism, optimism about the future, about our country, about capitalism and what our people can do. Some people might think that it's self-indulgent to spend time now thinking about the future of the economy, that we've got plenty on our plate with Article 50 and the process of Brexit, <clears throat> but the next general election is far away. I disagree. We need to unscramble our compass, find our way and proclaim our plan. The battle is being fought now, and often in politics we exaggerate the consequences to ease of what our opponents' policies could be. But this time there is no exaggeration. We can make no mistake. If Corbyn is in power, he will, he will change our country for the worse. And that is why it's over to us to win this battle. Thank you.